My Walls and Curtains My stepfather was a bad man. When I was 10 years old, he whipped me with a bundle of wet branches from the cherry tree for writing mailbox in awkward letters on the box he'd nailed to our door for the mail. It was the awkwardness of my writing that ignited him. He had other graphic plans. I thought he would be pleasantly surprised. My mother was. He beat her too. Another infraction a few weeks later resulted in him wrenching my dog and best friend, Nemo, from my arms. That was a fight I naturally lost. Nemo yelped and wriggled with all its hot dog might, then disappeared. Pressed every day for answers, the brute said that he'd given Nemo to our neighbors on the other side of the wall that separated our medieval courtyard from the medieval courtyard on the other side. My room was a sliver of space between the kitchen and their bedroom. There was space for my narrow bed and my bookshelf where I arranged in alphabetical order my books. Carl May, Mark Twain, Jules Verne, and the precious anthology of 100 of the world's best poems, translated into Romanian by the Communist Party's favorite translator, Mihai Beniuk. I had a small window from which I studied the wall, on the other side of which I listened for Nemo's bark. I spent hours studying this tall cement wall, cracked by rain and time. I knew every crack and thought of ways to get over Lasso, drill, bomb, flying horse. I had to get over to free Nemo. I dreamt one night the wall in hyper-realist detail, its spider web of cracks like a map. It was there when I woke up exactly as I had dreamed it, but the map gave me ideas. A map in a wall was in fact a guide to getting through it. In the anthology of 100 of the world's best poems, there was this by Edgar Allan Poe. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. Which uh, Mihai Beniuk, the official Communist Party translator, rendered into Romanian. Nui în lume zid care poate opri al nou partid which uh, re-rendered in English means there is no obstacle of stone or wall that can stop the party's forward goal. Now, this may seem awful in any language, but Ben Uke, who didn't speak or read English, gave me a great idea. I would study the map of cracks in the wall until I, too, a 10-year-old with superpowers would go through it just like the unstoppable communist party. And so I did. The cracks in the wall behind which Nemo lived now presented me with a map of getting through it. All I had to do now is to find what it was a map of the secret code spelled by the cracks. You are right to ask now why I didn't just go in next door and call my dog. Why did I have to go through the wall? You might even quote Stanley, our theory. It's not a crack in the universe. It's a crack in your head. That may well be, but as it turned out, there was a crack in the universe. I even had friends who lived in that courtyard. I did ask them in school if they had seen my dog. They hadn't. It appears that a bad man had given Nemo to another bad man hidden on the other side of the wall. A man so bad nobody knew him. At that age, I couldn't conceive of an adult lying to a child. Even my bad man, who was a brute and a captain in the army, would not lie about my dog. He may have intended to punish me, but surely the removal of Nemo was temporary. 
I had lied to my mom and my teachers, but it seems normal for children to lie to adults. I just didn't see why a grown man with immense powers and a captain in the army would stoop to lying to a child. I found out later that this was what adults do all the time. It may be an essential feature of adults. More than a hobby, a vice, or a part-time job, lying to the children is what grown-ups do when there are children about to lie to. This activity is hardwired in grown-ups for reasons that Melanie Klein and Robert Bly patiently explained many years later. There were some other matters concerning my avoidance of the neighboring courtyard. A few days before the bad man gave away Nemo, I spent the morning with my friend Schlezzi in our secret hideout above the courtyard, watching the secret police dig up the cobblestones and shovel out a lot of earth from under them. Schlezzi whispered to me that they were looking for the gold that the Rosenbergs had hidden there before they were taken in the middle of the night and shipped to Israel. Or so he'd heard from Anna, who heard it from their father. The thing is, we were in big trouble. We knew not only where the gold was, but we had it. I will tell you how we came in possession of it, but I will first tell you about our hideout. They won't find us, I reassured Schlezzi. Our hideout is perfect. Just don't sing. When you are ten years old, you have spent most of your life trying to hide. For me, personally, the search for a hideout started just before birth, when my mother's womb turned out not to be the safe place everyone thought it was. There were loud noises, angry voices, and a number of violent up or down heavals that tossed me like a baseball from one side to another of my humid shelter. The tube that connected me to the spaceship was sometimes filled with matter that repelled me, though I did eventually learn to like chicken livers, but never the cooked onions they tended to be smothered in. I can recall in detail the fetus menu that ranged in truth from the sublime peach jam to nausea-inducing matter like beet borscht. This was after the big war that could have eliminated even the idea of my existence, leave alone the gustatory whims of a developing fetal brat. I suppose that I should be grateful. The Russian soldiers drank all my mother's cologne, and finding a chicken was like finding a Nazi. Plenty before the war, invisible for a year after. The cobbler called it the year without chickens, and it sounded worse than aerial bombing. Eastern European cooking of the era was heavy on chicken cooked in onions and sunflower oil, with flour dumplings, potato soup, leeks, beets, and celery. It is understandable that in addition to becoming a food critic, I became somewhat leery of my habitation, and so an architecture critic in the bargain. As soon as I was freed from the tube and entered the earth atmosphere, I started searching for a safe place, away from the faces I now knew had made those angry voices, loud noises, and the involuntary gymnastics that made maternal imprisonment unbearable. I will skip the accounts of the terrible structures, cardboard boxes, the undersides of Biedermeyer furniture, the four-poster bed, that were safe for a while until they weren't. Unemployed war widows scoured for pennies the homes of the employed. My mother, who worked, engaged Ilse, 
a crispy Saxon to look after me. This is what she literally did. She soon found me. She pumped DDT under the bed and furniture and burned the boxes. My next hideout lasted three hours. It was in a wooden trunk in the attic. It was filled with volumes of an 1879 Austrian encyclopedia. I removed 10 of them and set them neatly on the floor. There was now enough room for me. I crawled in and closed the trunk lid over my head. The Austrian encyclopedias, still in the box, smelled good and were solid. Three hours later, Ilse's infallible Saxon sense of propriety found the books on the floor. She lifted the top of the trunk and started to put the heavy tomes on top of me without noticing me. After two of the heavy volumes compressed me painfully, I gave a shout that nearly gave Ilse a heart attack. She freed me, slapped me, and I helped her put back the missing volumes, H through K, and was remanded to the general population. I consoled myself with the thought that my sojourn among the encyclopedias had infused me with a great deal of knowledge, useful later in life for finding a better hideout. My second hideout was better, good enough to see me through a great many perils. I found it after I died at the age of three. A truck full of soldiers was approaching at great speed toward me. I got up from the sidewalk where I had been urging some ants toward the remains of a dead rat and stood at attention. I might have saluted, I can't remember. As the truck barreled past me, one of the soldiers aimed his gun and shot me. I died. This was the first time I died, so I immediately proceeded to find the hideout. A hideout, to be any good, must, first of all, be safe from soldiers. Secondly, it has to be out of reach of firearms. Thirdly, it has to dissuade interested parties from finding me in order to A. not be found, B. shelter me until I was hungry enough to get out at midnight to steal bread, and C. be comfortable enough to bite, scratch, pull hair, and knee anyone who attempted to extract me. My friend Schlesi and I discussed the problem of hideouts for many days before we found the one we now observed the action from. Throughout our discussions, the thought of why we might need to hide never occurred to us. We took it for granted. I find this curious now, but if we didn't ask why then, it would be even more useless now when there is nowhere to hide. The surveillance state would not take notice. That said, I don't think that ten-year-olds are any less clever because more eyes are watching. Our medieval city had been in the surveillance business for its entire history. All the walls had ears, and all the roofs had eyes. The soldiers put down their shovels at midnight. They didn't find the treasure. The soldiers set camp among the mounds of dirt and stone there and started drinking. Some of the neighbors joined in and passed bottles of wine and salami around. Soon they started singing. From our hideout we could hear the songs, drunken laughter and snippets of conversation. How long before we could leave the hideout, said Shazzy, his voice uh, trembling a little, which is why I left out the L. My mother must be frantic. She has ill fate in wolf mode, I said. My father has unbuckled his belt already, said Schlesi, not to be one-upped. We discussed, in a whisper, the downside of our perfect hideout. The problem was architectural. We couldn't leave until the bad guys did. 
we had to approach the question of hiding out from another angle. I suggested psychological, in the sense that the best hideout may not be, after all, a place. The best hideout may be mobile, in the sense that if we could anticipate from the time of day the comportment of the persons who are attempting to take us prisoner, we might outguess them by moving into the second place to where they might look for us. And if we then guessed the second place, we had plenty of time when they first missed to move to the third place and so on, always staying one move ahead of our captors. This was chess, a game both Schlesi and I were very good at, though we were not the world's greatest psychologists, as evidenced by the fact that we had been caught, whipped, and humiliated numerous times. We had some work to do if this kind of hideout was going to serve us. The disadvantage of psychological hideout chess were also considerable. For one thing, we couldn't hide anything but our person and what our person could carry in this sort of maneuver. Anything as heavy as a wooden chest filled with gold coins that we had stashed in our physical hideout would slow us down too much for the psychological hideout gambit. The solution might be, proposed Schlesi, to carry only as many gold coins as to make gold necklaces, braces, hollowed out school hats and walking sticks filled with coins. And then these accoutrements to slow us down, of course, so we had to practice. Nomads had practiced carrying their wealth and jewelry on their bodies for thousands of years. But we had only a few days to figure it out before our enemies saw that we moved like turtles under the weight. Well, maybe I said the perfect hideout was a combination of geographical, architectural, and psychological. We would first find an impregnable hideout for our treasure, and then we would practice the psychological moves discussed. Later, when we had confused our would-be captors at the speed of lights that we, as Jewish children, thought of as our birthright, then our hunters had collapsed from exhaustion, we would find our way to physical hideouts and take as much as we needed to eat, eat and improve our safety. There is another problem, said Schlesi. Namely, that in order to improve our safety, we have to clear a number of borders. First, there is the very wall we're hiding in, which has drunk and armed hostiles at its base. Then there is getting through the courtyard itself without being seen by the neighbors. Then, once we get out of the courtyard, we have to go through the old city, which is full of eyes looking for us. And then, if we successfully get away from the eyes, there are the two fortified walls that surround the city. The crumbling stone one from the 17th century and the brick stone wall with the guild towers built in the 18th century. And if somehow we get through these, we have to clear the moat, which is inhabited by insane leprous dragons. And if we are successful, a big F, we have to reach the Danube River at night by walking across two kilometers of mined fields, swim across the Danube, unless we could improvise a raft with branches from trees, and when we cross the Danube, we still have to hide until we reach what people called the Iron Curtain, an impediment made of actual iron, and it thus presented us with a nearly insurmountable problem. Hmm. Yes, I said that's all true, my friend, but these are problems we can solve, because kids like us were invented for such challenges. And if we solved all that, all we have to do is use our gold coins to buy a stone castle on an in inaccessible mountain cliff somewhere in the Swiss Alps and surround it to defenses that would be absolutely unbreachable by Ilse or Schlesi's father. By the time the full moon started its descent into the morning sky and the drunks below had quit howling anti-Semitic insults at the cleverness of the Rosenbergs who had hidden their treasure so well the whole secret police of the region had been unable to find it, we were getting sleepy. Schlesi said, mm -hmm, too. And by the time the full moon started its descent into the morning sky and the drunks below truly, truly quit, I stayed awake 
just long enough to think about Nemo. My hot dog, my schnauzer. I still had to rescue Nemo. He would be of invaluable help to us as we made our escape from hideout to hideout to the Swiss Alps. Dogs have an incredible sense of smell for one thing. Which is why, incidentally, I haven't figured out why he hadn't just come back. I woke up early and nudged Schlezzi with my boot. I was wearing my stepfather's dress boots he wore on parades, May 1st and August 23rd, the days respectively of International Workers' Day and Romania's liberation from Nazi Germany by the glorious Soviet troops. These boots were big and shiny and had their own room under the cuckoo clock. I first tried them on when I was nine and a half and I found that they were full of gold coins rolled in a sock, which was perfect because they fit. I paraded through the bedroom in them and almost got caught by Fräulein Ilse, whose job was to shine them for parades, a job she did with such vigor and pleasure that sweat and tears rolled down her face into the boots, which filled with them and never quite dried. I only saw this once from under the bed. Her tears never stopped even after she put back the boots. She kept crying in the chicken soup she made after that. When I refused to eat it, she grabbed me by the ears and pushed my face into the boiling broth. My face was covered with spatzel-like boils for a week. She had her reasons. Her two sons died in their boots on the Eastern Front. They were in the Eastern SS their job was to kill Jewish children like me. Anyway, she liked me a great deal. When my mother was working nights in the Photoshop, Ilse took me to her house where she put me to bed on crisp cold sheets while she shoved coal into the tall stove. I pretended to sleep when she slid in next to me. I held on to the big tuft of grey hair between her legs and dreamt that I was on a ship. Above the bed, Dressed in shiny boots, her strapping SS sons watched proudly as they gave their best to the Wehrmacht photographer. Ouch! screamed Schlesi. The gold coin enforced boot tip was hard. We looked out the hole in our hideout. The hung out soldiers rolled tobacco in the flame, the newspaper, and scraped flakes from their dry lips. My mother brought out a can of Nescafe and poured it into tin cups. She gave everyone a hard-boiled egg. My stepfather, the army captain in charge of the brigade, shouted at them to start digging. This might be a good time to go in the tunnel, said Schlazi. Leaving our hideout and going into the tunnel involved brief exposure. We had to use handholds to descend. On the way down, there was a hole in the wall visible from both courtyards, often used by chickens to hatch illegal eggs. The chickens were illegal too, so the question what came first was answered. Chicken and eggs were simultaneous communal property. In the book of Stalinist arithmetic, there was no first. Everything was everybody's. My stepfather didn't get illegal eggs. He was a man of the law. My stepfather arrested and collected. The owners were sent to forced labor at the garrison to clean toilets and shine boots. My mother boiled the confiscated eggs. Using handholds on the way down, we passed a hole in the wall that was visible from both courtyards and almost ran into a hatching chicken, but were able to disappear before its squawking made the diggers look up. My stepfather, the captain, was nearly blind and had not risen to his rank because he could shoot. He rose from sergeant major to captain because the general believed that he was an educated man and a poet who wrote poetry. He walked around the garrison carrying the book 100 of the world's best poems. Nobody there knew that inside the covers of 100 of the world's best poems was a notebook with notes on the informers and the number of illegal eggs and other infractions uncovered in the exercise of his duties. 
He had ripped off the covers of my book, 100 of the world's best poems, to stick his notebook inside. An act of vandalism that I added to my growing list of things I would one day murder him for. One day, a week before he kidnapped Mimo, he had a big fight with my mother. I heard her crying in the bedroom. I rushed in and hurled myself against a bad man. He gave me a boot, his everyday army boot, and I flew out the open door and hit my bookshelf. It toppled. I then saw that the world's 100 best poems had no covers. One day, I would add this to the book of Stalinist arithmetic. Give a kid the boot and the books falling on his head will make him a poet. I wrote a poem, so good it was published in The Flame, the local newspaper. I am a brave soldier ready to die for my land. I hold my gun at the ready and a book of poetry in my hand. My stepfather told everyone that he had written it and word had it that he would be made a colonel on account of it. Everyone at the garrison, including the general, read the poem. In fact, the general made it mandatory for all the soldiers to memorize it. Every Sunday, an old actor from the National Theater in Bucharest read on television a poem from one of the regional newspapers. The Sunday after the poem was published, he intoned with a great deal of oracular gravity and self-importance. I am a brave soldier, ready to die for my land. I hold my gun at ready in the book of poetry in my hand. This poem, he declared with a grave authority of 80 years' experience as an actor at the National Theatre, was published in The Flame and written, unbelievably, by a 10-year-old poet. The garrison was astir at the news. The general called my stepfather to his office. He was demoted back to sergeant. My mother divorced him. The stink of his boots that told me he'd been there when I came home from school was gone. Who says poetry makes nothing happen? This happened when I was ten and a half, so I am getting ahead of the story. But that's okay, sometimes you just have to. When Schlesi and I had gotten successfully past the hole without being betrayed by the chicken, we could smell the damp, humid tunnel already. We lowered ourselves below the wall into the mouth of the underground tunnel under the Ursuline Monastery, where hundreds of nuns were buried in the walls. The citizens of our town had used this tunnel, which forked into other tunnels, to escape into the woods when Goths, Visigoths, and mostly Turks besieged the city, burned down the houses, and impaled the citizens, including babies. The humid air of the underground smelled damp and heavy where mothers Teresa, Mary, and other countless servants of God had been interred for centuries in the walls. And that is where most of our treasure was hidden, with the exception, of course, of the gold coins in my stepfather's parade boots. Me and Schlesi, we could do anything. The funny thing about being in a tunnel is that you suddenly don't care about what's happening on Earth. Everything is quiet and smells of Earth, and it's like you've been there forever. There are many things that live there, all of them blind. Lizards, insects, fish, spiders, animals that are not only blind, but that you can see even if you shine your flashlight on them. And there are, of course, ghosts pretending to be busy. A ghost is a thing with issues, which is why it's a ghost and not a cloud of roving particles in search of a sturdier form. Ghosts are smoke in the shape of people, but it's thick smoke if they still have unresolved problems with the world of humans on the surface of the earth, 
Sometimes this human-shaped smoke forms have problems with each other, too. Did you ever see a ghost fight? I asked Schlezzy. He had sat down on a stone that was no doubt the door to the tomb of a departed sister. I can't see anything, he said, but I hear a lot of things. I was prepared for this. I had a box of wooden matches and a torch made from rags soaked in my stepfather's plum brandy. The first match I struck lit the rag torch. Shadows fled in all directions. The ghost of a golem caught his skirt on a broken gravestone and flapped there like a freaked-out bat trying to get away from the rabbi whose dead daughter he was in love with and was looking for in the underground. I hear water, whispered Schlezzy. He wasn't wrong. A twisty stream ahead was sounding like our kitchen faucet turned all the way up, which means that it was more like a steady drip than a roar. Water pressure was unpredictable during Stalinism. Our faucet barely gave up enough to fill a pot to boil potatoes in. On Saturdays, when the family took a bath, it took all day to fill pots to boil and pour into a zinc tub. The bad man always went in first, a hairy protuberant pud who made whale noises and splashed our immaculate floors. My mother followed, a tender but determined form that rubbed armpits vigorously with lye soap and removed dead skin from her feet with a bone grater. After this, I was lowered in that gooey substance of dirt and grease particles and scraped at a file by Ilse while mother held me up by the ears and the bad man pulled my hair to keep me upright. We were clean after that and glowing with the love of Conrad Stalin. You digress, said Schlezzy. A lizard followed by a lizardess disappeared in a crack between gravestones. They left behind tiny black eggs that shone like BB pellets under the flaming rag torch. Those make good eating, I told Schlezzy, who looked disgusted. To prove the point, I gave him the torch and scooped a handful of these lizard eggs and put them in my mouth. They were crunchy and didn't taste too bad. I'd had worse. The thing about eating was that we school children ate everything. In the fall, on my way to school, I stopped to stuff my face with mulberries from a tree. At lunch, I gave my bread and jam sandwich to another kid, as did Schlazi, and the two of us ran to the peasant market by the river, where we pretended that our mothers sent us to buy stuff. We tried sharp and sweet cheese, cherries, salami, bread, whatever the peasants put out for housewives to taste. We ate better this way than 99% of our townsmen, including the docents at the Brukenthal Museum, where we hope to eventually sell our gold. I think that we may have eaten better than Comrade Stalin. Anyway, the lizard eggs tasted like caviar, but Schlezzi was having none of it. He was impatient to take a look at our treasure to make sure that it was undisturbed. The only trouble was that the rag torch was burning down fast and we would be in the dark in another minute. Which is just what happened. It's dark. It's dark. No kidding. The dark is dark. What are we going to do, fretted Schlezzi? We are going to pretend that we are dead. So what difference will that make? We'll still be alive and it will still be dark. Schlezzi has his moments. He didn't, of course, know about pretend. When you pretend, I said, that you are dead, the dark pretends that it's light. And then we jump out of being pretend dead into pretend light and are out of here before the dark catches on. At this point, I wasn't sure I wasn't, in fact, dead. I was drowning in squid ink, viscous darkness. 
It's what we get for stealing all that gold, lamented Schlezzi. Stealing? I was indignant. Don't you remember that I found it in the chemistry lab on top of the cabinet? It was full of Roman gold coins. I took them home in my school bag all week. Yeah, you told me after you made me hold the bag while you peed on that statue in the square. I almost fell over, it was so heavy. Well, oh, sorry about that. I really had to pee. Statues always make me want to pee. Maybe one day you'll travel and pee on every statue in the world, said Schlazy. This was his budding sense of humor. But I thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. I'll be rich and I'll go around the world peeing on statues. There are worse ways to spend your time, like going to school or having a police job like my stepfather. You can come with me if you want, Schlazy, I added generously. No, thank you, said my friend. What did you do with the gold? What should I tell him? I'd hid the coins in three places, but made some mistakes. First, I felt bad about taking it. And that was one mistake, my budding sense of guilt. And another was that I showed one coin to my stepfather's mother and asked her if I should return it where I found it or give it to her for safekeeping, or maybe take it to the Brukenthal Museum so they could put my name in the Brukenthal Yearly Bulletin and I'd be famous forever. Noble causes all, if you'd notice. And she said she'd take it for safekeeping. And she put it in her skirt and swore to keep it there for me and not whisper a word to anyone. But she did. She told my stepfather, the policeman, who told her not to tell anyone and keep it hidden there until he interrogated me to find out if there were more coins where that came from. But why did the police come for the Rosenbergs? asked Schlesi. That was my other mistake, see? I gave one gold coin to my classmate Esther. Why, in the name of Lenin and Stalin and Gergiu Dej, did you give a coin to Esther? I sighed. We both knew why. Esther showed the coin to her dad, a religious man and very pious, who slapped her and dragged her by her ponytail to our apartment to tell my stepfather where she got the coin, which is just what he needed to hear. He got the coin from Esther Rosenberg because Jews always have gold. He shouted that and then said, shh, to his mother. And she said, shh, back. I was already out the door by then in our hideout. It was Schlesi and I played chess every evening after supper. And then we saw the police come for the Rosenbergs and take them away in a black Volga, a duba. And then they threw them all into the Black Sea, my stepfather told the neighbor. They shipped them to Israel. So the next thing I'm going to do after I find Nemo is go to Israel. Is that before or after you pee on every statue? The kid's sense of humor is growing by the second. And where did you hide the coins after all that? He was never happy with one story. I told you that already. No, you didn't. It's true, I didn't. A good many were in the toes of my stepfather's parade boots, which I was now very tired of walking in, which is what I told Schlesi in the dark. And the rest, he guessed, you hid it in this putrid grave or we will die because we never can go back now. I swear that he was crying. His tears were plopping in the dark. That is true, I said. This is where love gets you. The plop-plop stopped. Schlesi held his breath. I didn't say anything for a very long time, long enough to hear the blind reptile slither into the hollow and rattle its eggs, maybe wondering what happened to about a human handful of them since I'd eaten them for my caviar mojo. 
But does a lizard really count its hundreds of tiny black eggs? What's that? crackled Schlezzi. Schlezzi was really scared this time. The lizard was still. What had I done? I was wearing the bad man's gold coin filled boots. I had harmed the girl I loved. I'd eaten the lizard's black eggs. We couldn't go back. I didn't like the Swiss castle idea anymore. I didn't want to go to Israel and pee on statues. I didn't even want to escape. I wanted to die. But I felt sorry for Schlesi, whose plopping tears I heard again, mixing with the lizards rattling and counting his eggs. Let's hide here for a while, I said, and then we'll go somewhere and change the gold coins into crypto. What? What's that? said Schlesi. Another thing you made up to hurt Esther and me? That was mean, Schlesi. I'll never forgive you for saying that. I proceeded with a chilly explanation. Cryptocurrencies are like crypto Jews. How is that? said Schlesi in a suddenly grown-up voice that predicted his eventual rise to be the head of the Federal Reserve in the USA when he emigrated a year later. But of course he knew nothing of his eventual fate, and neither did I. The crypto Jews went to Brazil, I said, where they pretended to be Christians by adding pork to the cholent, a dish they called feijoada. But they kept secretly lighting the candles at Shabbos. Don't we wish we had a Shabbos candle now, sighed Schlesi. We didn't. We were doomed to join the ghosts of dead nuns in the Ursuline convent walls forever and forever. I still had three matches. But before lighting one, two pinpoints of phosphorescent animal light pierced the darkness. I am not, as you have no doubt noticed, a big fan of fantasy. Just the facts, man. That's me. But terror is terror. In that state, the light of the animal eyes that lit our tunnel was soon followed by an embrace, by long arms that felt like chamois. Yes, there are no aliens. Yes, my stepfather is a brute. Yes, school sucks. Yes, I will find my dog, Nemo. Yes, I will die. But not now. If these were my terrified thoughts in the tunnel, I cannot imagine what Schlesi's thoughts were, if he had any. He curled into a ball of dark matter, impenetrable to me, but probably not to the animal eyes that took him in like a pea from the universal soup. The sleepy sensation that followed the chamois or chamois embrace was oddly comforting. Since we're on the subject of feelings, the idea of all that gold was comfortable in a completely different way. The comfort emanating from the chamois embrace of the monster was paralyzing like a feather comforter. The comfort of gold was wrapped in anxiety, like a delicious fruit wrapped in TNT. In the same way that there are different kinds of taste, comfort is also wrapped in sensations of bitter, sweet, and anxious, among ten other things. As the creature slid closer, I made out large red lips topped by a moustache made of round Dyson vacuum cleaners. The lips opened to speak, and the vacuums began rotating with the sound of that was at first jarring, then a layjack, like the late Philip Glass, of whom we knew nothing under Stalinism. Through the vrrr, 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 I made out a plaintive voice. Do not be afraid, children. I am a golem. I love children. 
I know already from the stories of Isaac Bashevis Singer, whom I hadn't yet read, that golems were, generally speaking, created to defend Jewish children. When I recovered a little from the terror, I whispered toward the dark ball that was schlezzy. It's only a golem, man. Don't shed your pants. The grateful golem tightened his embrace until I almost died, suffocated by attention. Hey, hey, I was able to say, easy on the loving golem. The golem loosened his embrace. In the same plaintive voice that I, I knew now for sure belonged to a girl, maybe my Rosenberg girl, he told us her story. She had been created by Dr. Elon van Frankenstein in 1716 from bits of material he had scraped off the highways of the future. What fragments, I asked. I can sound very rude when people or golems fudge the facts. Oh, the golem said, evidently embarrassed even as the lights of her eyes lit up the graves of nuns like a thousand candles. Dr. Elon made me from pets, mostly dogs, abandoned by their owners, who strayed onto the roads where self-driving cars roamed. These cars were very careful not to run over people, but they had nothing in their programming about pets. Hashem, Hashem, I exclaimed in half prayer, was one of the pets you are made of a dog named Nemo? The golem said nothing her lighted gaze wandering in the tunnels like a drunk policeman's flashlight. No, Golem, no! You must tell me now if one of the parts you're made out of was a dog named Nemo. Still silent, the Golem closed her eyes, retracted her chamois arms, and all was darkness again. After we stood in the dark for a while, like trembling bats in Oaxaca chocolate, we saw a light. The golem, regretting her cowardly retreat and the withdrawal of chamois, came back and set down at our feet one of her glowing eyes. It made the tunnel bright as day. Before we could thank her, she had vanished again, dragging her sad pet chunks in the stony path, like a penitent in Cuba. Female golems are made in Japan, Schlesi explained. He was a specialist in golems because his father was the rabbi and moyle at the last synagogue left in Transylvania. He had, of course, no way of knowing anything about Japan, least of all that cheap Japanese toys would overtake the free time of children in the West only to advance in the next decade to produce sophisticated female golems. He did not even properly know what the West was because we only learned in school about Russia. The rest of the world, as far as our school was concerned, was a wilderness inhabited by capitalist hyenas imperialist dogs, speculation scorpions, and greedy muskrats. The bestiary of communist schooling was much larger than this, so I wasn't surprised, while still behind the Iron Curtain, that the West also contained venomous rattler denigrators, perfidious journalist rats, and perverted night owls. All of this was still in the future. We were starving and tired. We trudged through the long tunnel, rolling the light of the golem's eye in front of us. At long last, we emerged at an exit in a rock above a rushing mountain stream. The grass smelled divine as we rolled in it after exiting. I think that tiredness was stronger than hunger, because we fell asleep for an hour. I dreamt that I was working in a golem factory, wearing a white suit and goggles. Blue golem eyeballs rolled on the assembly line, where I fitted them to smooth vinyl foreheads. There must have been a shortage, because I was only allowed one eye per golem, 
which I placed in the middle of her forehead for symmetry reasons. At some point, I started swallowing them. I felt guilty because I was sure that if the factory managers caught me eating golem eyes, I would suffer a dreadful punishment. I woke up before they could find me. I was so hungry, I'd have eaten Schlesi, an act of cannibalism that in the hypnagogic state between dream and whatever this was, was certain to be less egregious than swallowing golem eyes. I had the strangest dream, said Schlesi. We were eating matzo ball soup in the ritual bath at the synagogue. My cousin Sarah said that it wasn't proper to turn the water in the ritual bath into chicken soup and that the matzo balls, while being certainly delicious, were actually our bodies floating in the soup. It's hard to explain. Oh, don't bother, I said. I know what you mean. We are hungry. We started looking for food. We rejected the bright red berries in a nearby bush because they were too easy to find and probably poisonous traps hung there by capitalists. We also passed by a dry tree with sun-cured pastrami rabbits hanging from the branches, begging for mustard. Our will crumbled completely, however, when we came to a scrawny fig tree that had plump letters hanging from it. These letters were meaty and smiled maddeningly of fried chicken. We fell upon them like ravenous scholars faced at an original scroll of the Bible. We scarfed down hundreds of these letters. I almost fell into a food coma. I had eaten so many. It was only years later I realized that in a single greedy bout of letter scarfing, I had eaten my way through a good portion of the world's literature, a gluttonous fever of which the Austrian encyclopedia I once hid in was but a small appetizer. It was in those later years that I understood also why most writing committed by my contemporaries bored the shit out of me. I had consumed it already in my tenth year, and I had promptly evacuated it from my bowels not long after. Schlesi ate just as much, but he must have had a different stomach and brain, because in those later years when I experienced literary nausea, he had worked his way from a Harvard economic degree to the top position in the World Bank. Until those later years came, many other things happened, and this is no way to tell the story. I restored myself to chronology and tell you now what happened next after we fed in the forest. There was an old house at the top of the hill, all crooked, boarded windows, door hanging off a hinge, weeds, wild flowers, autumnal foliage, a tree with sour apples. We climbed up the ridge to it and hacked our way to the door. It's a horror story, said Schlesi, conversant already with genre. It could also have been a fairy tale, or a narrative Edwardian poem, or a lecture about ticks, since it was clear that deer lived in the bent grass, or the story of an abandoned cat that had made home for three litters that had eaten all the songbirds of Austria. But it was neither of those. It was the house of the dead shoemaker. His skeleton was bent over an anvil, collapsed over a high-heeled shoe. His hammer fallen to the side and nails all over the cracked boards of the floor. There was no smell of rotting flesh, so by the looks of it, it was a century old. Picked clean by birds and insects and even now some kind of flies tried to enter his bones through tiny holes that had already given up their marrow to other bioforms. The odd thing was the halo over the skull. A ring of light as bright as a harvest moon, rotating lazy. It's not a house of ushers, said Hansel. I mean, Schlesi. There is no kitchen. That's true, I said, but it might be prose poetry. 
something I hadn't heard of for 15 years yet, but which hung like a dead bird in the pantry of my future. In any case, I took off my stepfather's boots in the shoemaker's house and poured all the gold coins on the floor where most of them rolled into the cracks. And I shoved the ones that didn't until they too rolled into the cracks. And they were gone into the damp, dank underhouse spiderwebs where they remain to this day, where you can still find them today if you are into money. I am going to be a poet, I told Schlesi. And the first rule of poetry is that you must be poor. Like a church mouse, asked my friend. I've never seen a mouse in a church, I said, committed to the truth as I had never been before I became a poet. And because truth was on me, the hello over the dead shoemaker's head migrated to mine and I stood there like a Byzantine icon of myself. And Nemo asked the future head of the World Bank, there are two more adventures, plenty of time to pick up the thread, find Nemo, conclude this shaggy tale, and go find some bread, feta cheese, olives, and wine. It's a deal, cried all my fans on social media. The sun set over Armageddon. There was grief. If we had known the name for it, we would have had it. In the evening of the third day of walking inside that feeling we had no name for, we saw the lights of a village, or maybe a small city. Our grief dissipated, but our apprehension, another word we didn't know, what feeling it nominated, our apprehension increased, because the people in this village may have been hostile to boys. We had heard of Emefria, a possibly Minoan settlement inhabited by 230 witches that had cooked at least three Hansels and Gretels each, which gave the place a bad reputation and an evil smell. As we approached, warily, listening carefully, we heard nothing. This is a problem, I said. If you hear nothing, it may be because there are no people, birds, or animals in this place. Sure, but there are lights, said Schlazi. Who would benefit by those if there was nobody to read or do other things people do and they can't see? The lights could be alive, I said, so maybe the lights are these creatures that are not people, but ghosts making heat. Ghosts are always cold, so they friction their ectoplasm until they get warm and become visible to people. My theory of ghosts came from a dream I wasn't about to tell Schlesi about. It involved the future and the past to roll in three images like a 3D tarot card. It was the kind of dream that if you tell anybody, they would have you committed. Let's just sneak in and find out, I said instead. Maybe we can steal some food. Unfortunately, I had been right. The lights we had seen wandering about were wandering about an overgrown cemetery. They were ghosts, committing silent frottage to keep warm. No sign of bread or smoked meat anywhere. The lights didn't even see us, although we were the meatiest things around. The ghosts were too involved with each other to care about small humans. I don't know if I can go on, said Schlesi. He was right. We had hidden walls, escaped through damp tunnels, had encountered a golem, and had lightened our load by getting rid of our gold. Now it was time for victuals and sleep, or we would become lights ourselves. Just as we were about to give up, a phone rang. 
don't ask. It was just ringing and ringing like the phone in 10,000 movies that didn't yet exist, the ringing of the phone that signaled a radical change in the lives of movie characters. I picked it up. It was Mark Twain. On the phone, I tried to remember if they had phones when he lived. I could have Googled it if the internet had been invented. Alas, in a world of light ghosts, a hungry boy cannot do everything, right? Not quite, Mark Twain said. There is, for instance, a game that you two boys can play and never again be hungry or tired. When I was working on a steamship, we used to get together in the evening to drink and tell stories. We invented a game called A Story Without End. We all took turns telling a story that got to an unbearably exciting place, and our fellows had to finish it, everyone in his own way. Who is it? asked Schlesi. It's my mom, I said. She wants to know how we are doing in that school she sent to us five years ago. She sent us a school? No, she sent us to school. Tell her we're doing fine, but I'm about to die from hunger. Tell her to tell my mom to bring over latke, sour cream, bagels, cream cheese, and cherry soup with fennel. On the phone, Mark Twain explains that making up an end for a story somebody else made up was the most satisfying thing on earth, and that we would feel neither hunger nor cold if we did that. I would have patented the idea, continued the writer, but I lost lots of money in the avant-garde, so I ain't doing it now. Besides, I'm dead. Have you ever seen a ghost try to file a patent at City Hall with a clerk like Bartleby? For example. Well, for example, said Twain, I told a story about a man on a horse going to propose to the woman he intended to marry. He was thrown by the horse into the arms of three wenches who pulled off his carriage blanket and rolled him into the grass by the side of the road. Then they all sat on him to discuss what to do with the fellow. Meanwhile, a raiding party led by a golem could be seen approaching from the hill and heading directly toward them. And? That's the story, Twain said. Now you finish it. What did she say, asked Schlesi. When is she getting here with the vittles? I can smell them. That's easy, I told Twain, but I'm too hungry to be in the mood for storytelling. The lights in the cemetery gathered, gathered themselves into a raiding party and started to head towards us. You sure ghosts don't eat? Schlesi was experiencing terror again. I was sick of it. And so, if they do what? At least somebody will be eating something. Be objective. This is a good place, I said, to blow this popcorn joint and let listeners finish the stories, both that of Twain and of the approaching ghost traders. Schlesi could only nod his assent. I do not recommend walking through 12 miles of a minefield. Isadora Duncan and Nureyev decided not to do it, but Schlesi and I did. We were silly children. You can find children or angels thread the long black hairs of imprisoned princesses through the heads of needles they later used to inject heroin. But I digress. When we accomplished the dance through the deadly field, we had little time to bow for applause. We were arrested. Just as we were about to plunge into the Danube, two soldiers trained their automatic pistols on us, and the wolfhound threw himself at my thigh. For a brief second, the smell of dog and fear reminded me of Nemo as he was pulled from my arms by the bad man. Had my schnauzer been brainwashed by the border police into a wolfhound? Had Nemo become a meat machine programmed to destroy boys trying to escape socialist realism? 
This is the kind of thought that ballet and machine guns generate in combination. In such a moment, you must always remember the following epitaph, Amor vincit omnis. The soldiers marched us to a border shack. They ordered us to sit on the floor. Thank you, said Schlesi. What a turd. You're welcome, said the one with the gray mustache. We saved your lives. How is that, I said. You were about to die in that thing. The river, I said. That was water. I can swim. Not water, said the one without the mustache. It's a sheet of two-inch steel called the Iron Curtain. It's the horizontal curtain. We have to scrape it every day for people who think it's water. If you had plunged, said the gray moustache, you'd be balls of mangled flesh with bits of bone sticking out. What now, I said. The two soldiers looked at one another. Gray moustache pointed to the wall behind the wooden desk. Hanging there from two hooks were a pair of drills. Above the drills was a framed print of our father, Comrade Stalin. It's simple, said no moustache. You have to drill for one hour through the iron curtain and slip to the other side. If you manage it, you're free. If you don't, we'll scrape you off later. We grabbed the drills and rushed to the iron curtain, formerly the Danny Brewer. After 55 minutes of futile drilling, we hadn't even scratched the steel. With five minutes to go, I threw my drill away. It skidded, and it hit something I couldn't see, but heard distinctly. It was a door with rusty hinges. There are two kinds of drills, the kind that opens doors and the kind that shuts them. My drill was the right kind. We slipped through the low door and Bam! That's the thing about dialectics. There are two of everything. If you pick the right one, you're okay. If not, you must drill up the stairs of pain. As you can imagine, I kept my eyes shut the whole time we went through the steel door. Just before I opened them, Schlesi shouted, Food! I can't believe it! It's food! I opened my eyes. A man with a tall hat and a cigar stood in front of a long table covered with steaming dishes. Towering above all the dishes was a tall, uncovered pot of golden broth with fluffy matzo balls floating in it. Schlesi flung himself at the pot with his hand in the air, ready to fish a matzo ball out of the boiling broth. Not so fast, growled the man with the top hat and cigar, whose name turned out was Mr. Capitalism. He waved his hand over the dishes that smelled so good I almost fainted. On each side of the table were mounds of blue jeans and t-shirts with band names on them. We had made it to the West. The West jutted out of the horizontal iron curtain in the form of a long restaurant table. Mr. Capitalism fixed us with eyes beaming business. Before you gorge on this splendid usufruct, you have to answer that you're not a communist, an anarchist, a reptile, or a poisonous insect. He intones gravely. Just to underscore the gravity of what it would be like if we failed to answer correctly, he impaled a matzo ball with a gold toothpick and stuffed it in his mouth hole. That did it for me. I said, I am a boy in search of his dog. He checked a long list of things, but boy looking for lost dog was not on it. So I passed. And you? Schlesi turned all kinds of purple like a drunk chameleon. Okay, said Mr. Capitalism, looking at me while Schlesi was rearranging his suspicious chromomorphosis. You can pull on some jeans, pick up a shirt, and sit here and have orders until the musicians show up. The West was even better than I imagined. Schlesi barely squeezed out of the questionnaire. When he did, he was as white as an aspirin. 
Before we started gorging, Mr. Capitalism explained the menu to us. Liberty fries. Do not fear ketchup. It is the blood of freedom fighters. Pancakes. Edible flying carpets used to fly below radar. Matzo balls. Historical cannonballs filled with the Ten Commandments. Steaks, sirloin, flank, skirt steak, and prime rib. Roasted manifestos, cows still die for. And so on. There was no silverware. Schlesi pulled out a matzo ball bigger than his head. The broth burned his hand. Those of you who shook hands with him later when he was head of the World Bank will have certainly noticed that he always wears gloves that are very much like skin, but still feel like gloves. After we had gorged ourselves on olives and sourdough breads that had grown in defiance of school manuals, three kinds of anarchist olives grown in Luddite communes, and a variety of cheeses that compressed the territorial disputes of long standing were ready for the West. In our new blue jeans and t-shirts, mine said Lennon, we headed for new lives. Mr. Capitalism opened the doors of the limo for us, and we were off. I felt very hopeful. The beastly stepfather had given Nemo to a man on the other side of the wall. Now we were on the other side of the wall. The limo glided like a gondola through the night towers of New York. Now and then I would glimpse through an arrow of light a window on the 35th floor of a skyscraper where a dog watched television from an armchair. In the West, digs are very expensive. I wouldn't be surprised if Nemo had been sold by the neighbor to a rare dog dealer specializing in antiquities from the Soviet Empire. I had no business gliding in this deluxe Montgolfier through the capitalist sky. Schlesi was another story. He was lowered down a ladder onto the roof of the Empire State Building and taken someplace soft and weird. I didn't see him again for 50 years. I myself was let out in Brooklyn and put in charge of a vast rescue operation that housed and distributed 100,000 dogs a year to childless couples. Nemo was found by a mercenary in a Manila slum. Informed of my interest, he showed up in a dream with a ransom note. I paid in gold I didn't have any more. This didn't bother him because gold is the same whether you have it or not. If you have it, it's heavy to carry. If you don't, it's easy to imagine. Which is about the same, except not having it is better for your back. We made the exchange in a house of ill repute on the Barbary Coast. As soon as he spotted me, Nemo leapt into my arms, a ball of joy that licked my face. I kissed him on his wet nose and caressed him until we both fell asleep. I know that this was a sad story. I know this is a sad story. I know that you don't want it to end. I don't want it to end. I know that a happy ending is an end. Well, you're in luck. The Nemo who fell asleep in my arms that night in a house of ill repute on the Barbary Coast where he had been brought to me by a Manila mercenary, that Nemo was not my Nemo. I mean, he would have fooled anybody less attached to him than I had been before the beastly man tore him from me, but he couldn't fool me. The new Nemo, though an affectionate dog and a fine companion, was not the Nemo of my childhood. In fact, I must tell you that in addition to not being my Nemo, 
this Nemo was a secret agent. Nevertheless, he became a good friend, and we had many adventures together, some of which may have cost me my life. Maybe I will tell you the story, but I warn you, it is much more adult and much more capacious.